it's uh, really good to be here, and uh, it has been fun to see what God is, uh, has done and is doing and will do in the future of uh, the ministry here at Anthem. Uh, today, as we continue the series that uh, you have been on, we're, we're picking it up in John chapter 11. So if you've got a, a paper Bible with you, uh, you got a, a phone, digital device, however it is, uh, go ahead and turn to and find John chapter 11. It's a famous story of a, a guy named Lazarus. And uh, we're going to see how uh, the Lord handled that situation and what we can learn about our own lives uh, from it. Uh, I I wonder how many of you have uh, had that experience of feeling like you're in God's waiting room, and it's somewhat like the waiting room at a doctor's office or whatever. It just seems to take forever and ever. Uh, I I think of God's waiting room a little bit sometimes like Christmas Eve. Uh, For a child, Christmas Eve is the longest year of their life. (laughs) Would you agree? Okay, it just seems like those seconds take days. But for the parent, Christmas Eve is the shortest night of the year. Amen? You know, I I, I remember as a kid thinking, man, this thing will never, ever end. And then as an adult, I'm looking at the clock and I go, I ain't done with a bike yet, you know? Can I turn this thing backwards? And then I get all done except for one piece, you know, that is, is, is missing. It just seemed to be such a different thing. It's the same amount of time, but we're looking at it from completely different perspectives. And when it comes to waiting for God to do something that he's promised in our life or we're waiting to find out what he's up to, we sometimes can feel like the kid. And I want us today to get the perspective of the parent, if you will, our Heavenly Father. So we're going to talk about God's waiting room, and and we're going to go through the passage, see what we can learn. And then the next thing we want to do is I'm going to step back, and you can see it on the little note card you've got. And I want to talk about five principles that we can see. What can we learn about uh, how God carries out his promises? What can we learn about God's waiting room, what it's actually like and what we should expect? And I also want to give you some very practical advice about what you and I can do when we're in the midst of God's waiting room and it feels like Christmas Eve and we feel like we're four years old. Okay, so with that said, let's. Let's just go ahead and dig in today's passage where the wait was so long that everyone thought Jesus had blown it. He had totally missed the opportunity to do what he said he'd do. And we start in in verse 1 of John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from uh, Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Hey, your special bud, the the one that you are so close to, he is very, very sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Can you get any more crystal clear than, than that? I mean, this is a flat out promise. Don't worry. I know the Greek word there is for a extreme sickness. Do not worry. This sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. It's like, I don't need that kind of love. Would you agree? In my Bible, I've got the word or your digital advice. The word so is, is, is circled and highlighted because that it is so opposite what we think. We would think, hey, the one you love, the one you're so close to is, is sick, very, very sick. So Jesus would drop everything and, and, and rush to a, a Bethany to be able to take care of him. But that's not what it says. After promising he won't die, he, because he loved him, so for that reason... When he heard he was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his, uh, his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, skip all the way down to verse 17, because in verses 8 to 16, he has a conversation on the journey with his uh, disciples, and he's explaining to them that he's going to resurrect uh, Lazarus from the dead. But they don't get any of it because they haven't seen that before. So in those verses, when you read them later this week, we'll just skip them for the sake of time now, they are totally confused as to what in the world he is up to and talking about, as is everybody in this story except for Jesus. 
Now, on his arrival, verse 17 says, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for, talk to me, how many days? Four days, okay? He had waited how many days? Two days. So he had from where he was to get this place just outside of Jerusalem. He had a couple of day journey. So when he made the promise, this will not end, this sickness will not end in death, it was probably within a few hours that Lazarus actually physically died. And then he carries around for two more days, and he says, hey, guys, it's time to go. And when he gets there, the dude's been dead for uh, uh, four days, okay? This is, <laughs> this is Christmas Eve and four years old, is it not? Now, verse 18. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of brothers. They had lived in, in uh, Jerusalem, Okay. Uh, and when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Now, notice Martha's words. Martha said to Jesus, if, circle and highlight that phrase, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know, even now, that God will give you whatever you ask. By the way, as we're going to see, she's not suggesting he's going to raise him from the dead. That never enters her mind. But Jesus said to her, your brother's going to rise again. And Martha answered, oh, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Oh, yes, Lord, she says. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now, this is a rather important thing because Jesus' apostles didn't even get that right away. It took them a long, long time to get it, and it's arguable until the resurrection, until they finally fully got it. They understood he was a gifted rabbi, maybe he's a prophet, uh, all kinds of ideas. There were, there were floating ideas among the disciples that, that he might be this promised Messiah that the Old Testament points to and all the prophecies speak about, but she gets it totally right here. You are that promised one, the one who all of the Old Testament points to, all of the prophets speak of. You are him. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, she said, and he's asking for you. Well, when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him, jumped down to verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said the same thing, Lord, if circle highlight underline you had been here my brother would not have died and when jesus saw her weeping and the jews who had come along with her also weeping he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled he emotionally was just kind of broken now one of the things we got to remember about jesus is a lot of us think that uh, jesus uh, was like uh, god in a bod and uh, a little like kind of the old clark kent in the superman movies you know, he put on the goofy glasses, and he acted like he didn't know anything, but all the time he was Superman, he just didn't let anybody know it. And then he put on that goofy little suit, and boom, all kinds of things would happen. Well, a lot of people think that's what Jesus was, because Jesus is God in the flesh, the second person of what we call the Trinity. But Jesus made it quite clear that when he lived his life as a human being, he sat aside and did not access his divinity as the second person of the Trinity. So he really had to learn to walk. He really had to learn to talk. He really pooped in his diapers. He was a real human being living that way. That's, by the way, why he could die on our behalf for our sins, uh, because he lived as Adam, but unlike Adam who failed, he succeeded. Now, he, Jesus himself said every miracle he did was in the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit we have. He said everything that he taught and everything that he did was as led of the Holy Spirit. So in this moment, he's feeling the deep sorrow that everybody else is uh, feeling at this point as well. And, and so he, he, he sees him weeping, and he's deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Well, where have you laid him, he asked. Well, come and see, Lord, they replied. And then Jesus wept at the sadness and the horror of the death. And then the Jews said, oh man, see how he loves him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Think of all the miracles he did. Why didn't he keep this guy from dying if he's so special? And it kind of strikes me as, as a picture. There are always, always the critics who think they know what God should have done. <laughs> 
Ever been there in your own life and, and know people, well, this is how God should have handled it. And so they're over there critiquing Jesus at this point. Now we pick it up in verse uh, 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been dead for four days. Like, what are you talking about? He stinketh. There's, there, there's, there's no way we want to roll away this stone right now. And here's what I want you to catch. Earlier, I pointed it out to you. When she said, I believe that you are the Messiah, when she said, I know that anything you ask the Father will be done, it had never entered her mind that, oh, good, Jesus is here to resurrect him from the dead. In fact, when he says, roll away the stone, she protests and said, like, why would we do that? He's started to rot already. We can't do that. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So, circle, highlight, underline, they took away the stone. This is going to become very important as we look at what life in God's waiting room is like in a few moments, because their belief was not positive thinking. Their belief, they weren't like, oh boy, let's see what Jesus is going to be up to. They were like, dude, you have no idea. The smell is going to knock you over. But they believed enough, even though they were sure the smell was there, Lazarus was dead for good. They believed Jesus enough to do what he said to do. They had zero expectation that Lazarus was anything but a rotting corpse. But they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Can you kind of imagine him coming out like this? And, and they are so, Lydia has to tell him, like, would you let the dude go? I mean, like, come on, take, take things off. And now notice verse 45. Therefore, because God chose to do things this way, and only because he did it this way, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. So ultimately, God was working, as he always does, as a hero of every story, for his glory, for Mary and Martha's joy, and for Lazarus' good. But in the midst of it, that's incredibly, incredibly hard to see. So as I said, in the balance of our time, here's what I want to do. I want to walk you through God's promises and how they work, God's waiting room and how it works, and then sprinkling in along the way some very practical tips from all of Scripture and from life on what you and I can do when we're stuck on Christmas Eve and it's waiting and waiting and waiting to the point that we're kind of wondering, like, did the calendar change? Did God change what he said he was going to do? Is God actually going to show up? So here we go. Five things. Number one, expect some confusion when God is at work. That's why it's called faith. What I kind of picked up early on in my Christian life is, well, if God's at work, I'm going to see it. The Red Sea is going to be parted. Miracles are going to happen. Lazarus is coming out of the uh, grave. And I... I, I would read the passages, and I would see the climax when everything took place, and I thought, ah, that's what happens when God is at work. But the truth is, God is often at work in the shadows, and we have no idea that he's at work, but he really is. And we need to expect some confusion when God is at work, and that's why we call it faith. Now, faith is simply trusting God enough to do what he says, and I want to explain what it isn't. It isn't positive faith thinking. So many of us have been told in our life, you need to have more faith. And what we, what we interpret that to mean in the English language is you have to have more confidence and positive thinking. It's like coming up to bat, you know, you, uh, uh, you've got a kid in little league or whatever, and, and it's, it's their turn to come up uh, at bat. And you tell them, listen, you got to believe 
that you're going to hit a home run. So they go up believing they're going to hit a home run, and they strike out, right? Because we cannot change reality by positive thinking, by, by a, you know, God doesn't reward a great imagination. What God awards is great obedience. And whenever we think that faith is about how we feel as opposed to what we do, we've picked up a Western European American def definition of faith that has a lot to do with our positive uh, uh, kind of thinking business seminars and, and, and church things and all that, but has very little to do with what biblical faith is. It's neither positive thinking, it's not mental gymnastics, and it's even not the absence of doubt. Because as we've seen in this story, Mary and Martha are completely filled with doubt that there's any chance that what Jesus has promised is going to take place. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, a mustard seed of faith? Help me out. Okay. Now, do you realize what that means? It's kind of one of those uh, stained glass or little uh, uh, word pictures that we use so often that we don't even understand exactly what it means. A mustard seed was a, the word picture, the metaphor in the days of Jesus that the, was used for the smallest thing you could imagine. It's, it's uh, like us today, we'd use a nano something or whatever when we describe it. Back then, they said a mustard seed, tiniest thing you can imagine. And of course, Jesus twice has a famous quote about uh, if you have a mustard seed of faith, you can move a mountain. <laughs> And not understanding what a mustard seed was, early on in my Christian life, when I'd hear it, I would, if I wanted something done, I would kind of go, okay, I need to have more faith. <coughs> so I'm praying about something, and I go, okay, I need to have bigger and bigger faith, more confidence. That's exactly the opposite of what Jesus said. He didn't say you need more faith. You see, he said you need the tiniest of faith. Why? Because it's not about I, how I feel. It's about what I do. The passage, one of the two passages where Jesus uses this phrase is in Luke 17, verses 3 to 6. And what was happening here is he was teaching about forgiveness. And he was saying, my forgiveness in the kingdom is very different than the kind of forgiveness you're used to. You will forgive somebody if they have an excuse. <coughs> you will forgive somebody if they properly apologize. You will forgive all kinds of things. But I want you to forgive over and over again every time they ask. Then at one point, he gives a number so high that one of his apostles says, Lord, increase our faith. We need more faith to be able to do this. And that's when Jesus goes into this riff about a mustard seed. Now, they're not hearing him to say you need more faith. They say we need more faith, and he goes, you don't need more faith. Just do what I said. Because the tiniest little faith, obedience, can move a mountain. And that's exactly what we saw here. Take away the stone. But Lord, the body is rotted. It reminds me of one of my favorite uh, stories in, in uh, the uh, New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's in the book of Acts. And James the Apostle has just been, uh, uh, had his head cut off. And the king realizes that a lot of the religious leaders are happy about this. I think uh, Peter's in prison. I think I'll cut his head off tomorrow. So word gets out, and they have a special prayer meeting. They gather together to pray and seek the Lord that somehow Peter would be released from the Roman prison and would not have his head cut off. Well, lo and behold, God answers that prayer. Long story short, he's, he gets out of prison, and he goes to where the prayer meeting is, and when he gets there, he knocks on the door. A little servant girl goes and looks through the little thing on the door to see what's going on because they're all locked up because the government's after them. And she looks, and Peter's there. And she freaks out. Ah, it's Peter. And she forgets to open the door and let him in. So she runs back, and she tells them, Peter is here. And I love their response starting at verse 15. Let's put it up here. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept on insisting it was so, they said, well, he must be dead. That must be his angel. And Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Now, I don't know about you, but I can have that kind of faith. Can you? I, I mean, look at this. 
Uh, Peter's here. You're out of your mind. They didn't say, oh, we know it. We knew God would come through. They go, you're crazy. What have you been drinking, smoking? What's going on here? And, and, and she goes, no, no, honest, it's here. And the, what do they go? Ah, I knew God would do it. No, they go, oh, crud, he's dead. We're too late. It must be his angel. And then when he finally walks in, they don't high-five one another about how good God is. They just go, they're absolutely astonished. Why? Because their faith was a mustard seed. And in that mustard seed, they prayed for the thing they knew could not happen. And what did God do? God showed up. There's always going to be confusion on this side. And that's why it's called faith. Trusting God enough to do what he says, even when it makes no sense. That's what we do in God's waiting room. The second thing about God's waiting room is this. Don't be surprised when God seems to move more like a glacier than an avalanche. Don't you wish he moved like an uh, avalanche? Just kind of pray and it's done. But that's not how it works. And the Bible's full of examples that that's not how God works. There's one in the book of Daniel about uh, Daniel praying to the Lord, how long are we going to be exiles here in Babylon? You've promised that you will return us to Jerusalem. How long is it going to be? And he fasts and waits upon the Lord and prays for 21 days. And then this angel shows up with the answer. And, and, and Daniel's kind of wondering, like, why 21 days? And then here's the crazy thing. The, the angel says this. The day you began to pray and fast, the Lord sent me with an answer. But I ran into the prince of Persia, a description for a demonic uh, 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 force in the unseen realm. And I was delayed for 21 days until an archangel came along and kind of broke me through, and here I am. Like, that screws up my theology. I, I can't tell you how big. I mean, when God sends an answer, I expect it to be immediate. And right there, God's pulling back the curtain to the unseen realm, which he, the Bible doesn't often, but when it does, it's got important stuff to say there's a battle going on. I'm not going to tell you why, because that's what I want to know. Why? How come? I've got all these questions. He just says, I'm going to tell you this. There's a battle going on, and I'm at work. And very often, it's going to take longer than you would think for reasons that you're not mature enough, smart enough, or you're not God enough to be able to understand. But I'll let you know that's what's going on. You see, an avalanche is pretty powerful. I had a sure tail relative that was killed in one of them, sadly. Uh, but an avalanche, despite its power and its force and, and all of that, the awesomeness of it, if you go there five, ten years later, you won't even know where it happened. It's like you can't even tell it happened. A glacier is the exact opposite. Uh, how many of you have ever been on an Alaskan cruise? Help me out. Okay, those of you who have, do you remember going to Glacier Bay? They always take you there. You go into Glacier Bay, and it's a really cool thing if one of the glaciers calves and splashes in the water, and they tell you that it happens all the time, but it never happens on the day you're there. <laughs> and so you spend a day watching ice melt. <laughs> it's like, what in the world's happening here? Well, what's happening is, unlike an avalanche, you can't tell it was there later, a Yosemite or a Yellowstone is being carved out of those mountains. That's how God works, like a glacier. God's timing is seldom going to be your timing and mine. That's one of the most important things I've had to learn. 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10 puts it this way. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. As I said, we're the four-year-old on Christmas Eve, and God is going like... I'm putting a bike together, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll do it at my pace and, and, and my time. Really practically, here's one of the things, whether you're new in your journey with Jesus or you've been walking a long time with him, understand this life principle. You and I will almost always overestimate what can happen in one year and greatly underestimate what God will do in five. That's almost the rule of life. You will overestimate what can be accomplished in one and underestimate what God will do in five. There's an old saying, it takes 15 years to become an overnight success. And it's so true. 
And that's why you and I need to figure out how to be in his waiting room and wait well, because that's the way it always works. This church, it's been so cool to see what God has done in the five years since it just began. But I want to tell you right now, none of you, you, you know, you have dreams of, hey, when you're in the next year, where we're going to go and all that. And then you run into COVID and it makes you go back a few steps and all of these things going on. But I want to tell you, you have no idea what God is going to be doing with this ministry and this church in 15 years. And if you could suddenly be transported there, you'd just be go, oh, must be another church. Why? Because God is at work, but he's working like a glacier. And he's carving out something great. And the churches that will be planted out of this church, the lives that will be changed, and the things that'll, that are going to happen are so beyond what you can imagine right now. I went through those same experiences in my own life when North Coast was starting. Like, are you kidding me? And God has that same thing for you as a church. And God has that same thing for so many of you as individuals. But day in and day out, it doesn't seem like it. You see, part of the problem is, if you've been a Christian very long, you read your Bible. No, don't stop there. It's good you read your Bible. But the problem is you read your Bible, and it's kind of a highlight reel, and we don't realize that. So imagine you, you've been in another country, and you've heard about American football. You know you're going to be moving to America in a few years, so you start watching highlight reels of football games. Or you even watch those games that, you know, just show the main plays. And so you think an American football game takes about 30, 35, 40 minutes. And then you go to a real one, and it's four hours. Because they got commercial breaks, and they got a halftime, and they got this, and they got that. And you're going, what's up with that? Well, that's how it is when we read the Bible. You can read the book of Acts in 30 minutes. But we forget it took 30 years for the book of Acts to be lived out. And it just happens over and over again. Abraham was promised by God. See this land that when he's up on a hilltop, all of this is going to belong to you and all of your descendants forever. And then God says, by the way, it's going to be 400 years till you get it. 400 years. Now we read that number and it's just a number that goes over our head. Go back in the calendar 400 years ago and realize what was going on in this world. And God had made the promise now, and only on the 4th of July of 2022 does it take place. When Joshua, the guy who followed Moses and led the children of Israel into this promised land 400 years later, when when he started, God told him this, hey, I'm going to drive out all of your enemies. And then he says, but I'm not going to drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Abraham, hey, I'm going to give you a son, even though you haven't had a son yet, and you're getting pretty old. 25 years later, he finally has that son. David promised that he's going to become the king of Israel. 25 years later, that crown is placed on his head. In God's waiting room, it's always moving slower than we think. (coughs) Whoops, it's supposed to go like this. (coughs) <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, he's at work at the shadows. Always, always at work in the shadows. It's part of the game. Number three, at the end of the day, God's timing will be always prove to be perfect. I want to tell you, on day two, when Lazarus died, it didn't feel very perfect, did it? On day four, when Jesus finally shows up, it doesn't feel very perfect. When he walks to the tomb and says, roll back the stone, it doesn't feel very perfect. But when all those who'd heard about this guy that was doing miracles and all that saw what God actually did, and they therefore believed, suddenly all the pieces came together. I guarantee you in heaven, there are no Yelp reviews about how God screwed it up. It all will make sense when it's done. His delays are always for our benefit, though sometimes we feel like that toddler. You know, a toddler gets a little box, stands on it a little bit, holds on to the side, reaches in and pulls out a very sharp knife. How cool is this? And then mom or dad come along and take it away. And that toddler's got to be thinking at that moment, how could an all-powerful, all-loving mom or dad take away my new toy? And often that's what we're experiencing when we wonder what God is doing. 
How could an all-loving uh, God, how could a, a God who can do all things, how in the world would he be doing this? Why would he wait two days? Why would he let Lazarus die? And when the story's all done, we will all go, this is the most amazing thing ever. Because his timing is absolutely always, always perfect. Number four, we never want to do the wrong thing to speed up the right thing. God doesn't ever need our help. And if you're like me, sometimes I found myself in a situation where I know exactly what God wants done, but I keep running into obstacles or things that make it not uh, happening yet. And, and there are times and places where if I will just make a little compromise, if I will just take something into my own hands, I can speed up the process and I can get where God needs it to be. But the fact is, doing the wrong thing to speed up the right result always ends up in a disaster. It is one of the great temptations of life to say it hasn't happened yet. There's a story about a guy named King Saul in the Old Testament where he was told by a prophet Samuel, after you win this victory, you're supposed to do certain things and you're supposed to make a sacrifice or wait until I come. And what he chose to do was Samuel didn't show up in time and day after day goes on. So he decides to take it into his own hands and he's doing the thing just as Samuel shows up. What he did was the right thing, but he did it at the wrong time, so therefore it was the wrong thing. We never want to step up and break God's timetable, step up and do some compromise of what we're not supposed to do, because if we will just nudge it, what God is trying to accomplish will take place. It never works out right. You know the story of Moses? Well, he apparently knew from a young, very young age uh, that he was uh, born to be the deliverer of Israel from their uh, centuries of slavery in Egypt. Now, if you're new at the Bible in Jesus, you might not know that this guy named Moses was actually raised in the household of Pharaoh. For a long story short, just take my word at it. So he's raised as a, as a child of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, one day he's out in, in, the, in the fields and he sees a fellow Egyptian in terms of what he's become beating up a fellow Jew in terms of who he is. And he jumps in, and he punches a guy out, and the guy dies. Well, he looks around, he goes, uh-oh, that wasn't the best thing. He doesn't think anybody saw it, so he digs a shallow grave, and he puts the Egyptian's body in uh, the tomb because he knew he was supposed to be the deliverer, so he thought he'd step forward and deliver his fellow Jew caught in slavery. The next day, he finds two Jews arguing with one another, so he goes in to stop it. Hey, I'm the deliverer. And one of them looks at him and says, are you going to do to one of us like you did to that Egyptian? And he goes, oh, snap. <laughs> the word is out. And so he runs into the wilderness, and he stays there for 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness until a burning bush shows up, and God says, now it's time to go back and deliver my people. He spent 40 years in the, in, in the desert when he could have spent those 40 years in the palace. Why? Because he tried to help God out. He did the wrong thing. Here's what we need to know about God's will. This might be an important thing for all of you that are struggling to figure out what's God's next step. God's will has two parts, and we focus on one. God's will has a what and a when. And just because I know the what doesn't mean the when is right now. And that's what waiting in God is all about. Be careful to, that you don't fall into that trap of, oh, I know what God wants, and it's not happening fast enough, so I'll just go and do it myself. You can end up in the desert for 40 years instead of in the palace. Because I don't know, given the choice of the two, let me pray about it, and I've got that figured out. And fifth and last. When you're stuck waiting, which we all will be at various times in our life, and you're wondering, when is that promise going to take place? Why isn't God showing up? Uh, why am I not important? Whenever you're in that zone, focus on what God wants you to do, not what you want God to do. Like, it's perfectly fine. Wake up first thing in the morning. 
be pleading with the Lord, Lord, will you? Lord, will you? That's what we're told to do. However, in the, in the midst of that, the number one question we want to have is, what am I supposed to do today? Because every day has a path of obedience. It might be as simple as go to work and make God look good in your attitude with your co-workers, in your attitude towards your boss. It might be as, as simple as forgiving someone who just did a wrong to you or spoke uh, gossiped or slandered or whatever, and you, you, know, you act like you've never done that to anybody else, and you're all you know, uh, uh, uptight about it, and he's saying, listen, this is today's assignment. I love how Proverbs 3, 5, 6 puts it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and what will he do? He will make your path straight. He'll get you where he wants you to go. I never know when I'm in God's waiting room whether today is the day he's going to show up or six weeks or six years is the day he's going to show up, but I know every single day of my life what I'm supposed to do to love God and to love others as he has commanded me. And when you're not sure that God's way will work, here's what you do. Hold your nose and roll away the stone. When you're pretty sure he stinketh, this won't work. This will backfire. Lord, you don't understand. I'm different. My situation is different. All of those things we come up with. Hold your nose and roll away the stone. And God will show up. Always has. Always will. Father, I would ask that you would take the things that we have looked at today and help us to see in very practical ways, not what somebody else needs to do with these things, but what we need to do with these things. Thank you for this story. Thank you that this is not a story. This is actual real history. And Lord, we want to take these principles of what you did then so that we might see you do the same in our lives today and now. For the glory of Jesus, I ask it. Amen.